back to fully equipped. The wall RB, zero killer, Uncle Gene. It's PJ Championship week, boys. And I gotta say, this is my least favorite major of the year. It it's I, I know that all the live and PGA tour players are coming back together. But it I I don't know. It just feels like a regular tour week to me. Maybe you guys diff maybe you guys disagree. Maybe we have differing opinions, but um, can I say one thing that's funny? Yeah. About that, and you mentioned like the mass, like the live and all that stuff is like, <laughs> um, at the Masters, it was like the Masters started, and everyone's like, let's not talk live. We're gonna, we're not gonna talk live. We're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna talk about the Masters. We're talk about the event, and then uh, Jimmy Dunn comes in like full Leroy Jenkins Monday morning. If you don't know what Leroy Jenkins, is, go Leroy check out this YouTube clip. Jenkins. It's so funny. He's just like, nope, nope. I don't care what a tournament it is. Leroy Jenkins, we're going to take up a whole day's worth of air by completely blowing up the policy board and then coming out and saying that it's not going anywhere. And I was just like, yep, this is different. This is kind of funny. We'll see whether this goes the rest of the week. And then obviously the Rory news, not positive in any way. I don't think divorced not, Rory is going to win I, by win by six or seven this week. I'm calling see, it divorced. Yeah. Rory is, is a man on a mission. He's going to lay waste to the field. I, I did. The worst part is, is that I called Scotty. He's going to win this week. He's going to win at the U.S. Open. He's going to go to the Open Championship with a chance for the for the Grand Slam. But divorced Rory is going to is going to knock some heads this week. I, I'm I'm terrified for the rest of the field. I want to uh, get a shout out to my boy friend from Oklahoma, Tracy Phillips, who qualified at 61 for the PGA. How sick this is that? Guy- that this guy is five foot nothing. I mean, he's like five foot five, you know, five foot six, buck 40, buck 50, grinding PGA uh, uh, club pro who has been like nipping this close. And uh, a few years ago, a buddy of mine caddied for him, and he was uh, like one stroke from qualifying and bogeyed the last hole and didn't make it and it looked like his window was closing and uh he got a spot at 61 pretty damn amazing so very very cool story big shout out to him that's awesome everybody wants to be uh (laughs) wants to be on the champions tour (laughs) hardest tour to get on out there i know it's so funny I, i was uh last week i was at my my daughter's basketball practice and one of the parents I was talking to and uh, she didn't realize that I was in in the golf industry. And she's like, man, my, my husband, he keeps saying when he retires, he wants to play golf full time and try and qualify for the champions tour. And I was like, good luck with that. She's like, oh, I know he has no shot, but it's just for whatever no reason, shot. everybody wants to do it. Everybody it's wants fi- to- five spots, five qualifying spots in Q school. Like that to me is like insane. And then people like even think insane. that they have a chance. Is like, yeah, you go beat Bernard Longer's out there at 60 something freaking years old, and he's just like grinding, grinding. And it's like, okay, and he's won two mate, like two masters. Yeah, have fun with that, boys. Well, what they, what everybody fails to realize is the Champions Tour doesn't want you out there. No. It wants names because if it's got yeah. a bunch of no names, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not doing very well. People, people tune in to see Hall of Fame golfers still continuing their career, not no names who are, you know, suddenly hitting their mark at 52 or something like that. So, yeah, that's it's something that I tried to explain to people because I, I can't tell you how many guys have come through and, oh, yeah, I'm getting my game in shape for the for the Champions Tour. And the conversation that I have to have with some of these guys is if you look at the competition that's on that particular tour, these are guys, like you just said, that are in the twilight of their professional career. For them, by the time they get to the Champions Tour, this is this is just the Sunday game with the boys. I mean, they have been in the spotlight and been in the winner's circle and had successful careers they're not feeling any of that pressure that a potential new up and comer feels coming out onto a major tour for the first time. These guys are out here having a good time and playing golf with their buddies. I mean, it's, it's competitive, but this is a, a field of seasoned professionals that have been doing this essentially their entire adult career. Yeah. 
They, they it's kind of like, well, I like Steven, Steven Alker is a guy who's like journeyman PGA tour professional and has just absolutely raked the coals with guys recently on the, on the champions tour for the last couple of years, made himself good money, but he was a journeyman pro on the PGA tour. And like, it was like, he just kind of like hit a stride. Um, then you got guys like, um, I just looked it up cause I couldn't, I couldn't remember his first name, but, uh, Ken Tanagawa who came out, uh, I think through two or three years ago. And he was like an assassin. Everyone says he was, he was like, I'm, I think he's an Arizona guy. Um, but he was just like an assassin at like whatever private club he was at in these money games against PGA tour players, um, like on the weekends. And they're like, come on, man. Like he played professional golf. Uh, was it UCLA played, uh, on like, you know, journeyman pro then comes out and just goes, goes nuts. And you know, why are we talking about the kick? Why are we talking about the champion store? <laughs> But anyways, yeah. Good luck to all the fun. folks. Out there. Good folks. Good luck to all the the no no offense to all the forty eight and forty nine year olds out there who was like like scratch golfers who think they're going to make the Champions Tour because, um, yeah, it's not going to happen. happen. I'm sorry, not going to happen. Next topic. Moving on. Moving yeah. on. Um. Okay. Well, I'm I'm going to keep this off the rails for a second because I have a <laughs> because I have a story to tell. So this week I am not at Valhalla. I made a trip out to Carlsbad and spent some time over at Callaway with uh, with their golf ball R and D team, seeing some really cool stuff. I gotta say, uh, keeping it to gear for just one second, <laughs> the, their Chrome Tour golf ball. I haven't switched golf balls in eons. Their Chrome Tour is seriously impressive this year, and it's, I'm not just saying that because I, I drank some Kool Aid there. I, I went in. I, it was basically a, a, a white paper visit, getting all the the really technical stuff. But holy shit, man, those golf balls are really good. Um, hey, that, hey, who presented to you? Uh, well, I mean, it wasn't really like a presentation. We it was more just a conversation. But uh, but Eric Loper was there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and Joe King, and um, I, can't, I always forget Brian's last name. Oh man, sorry, Brian, but yeah, it was it was basically the brain trust for for golf ball. It well, was, the the yeah. reason the reason I ask is it's a name that's not very well known. It's known within the industry, but to a lot of golfers, is Eric Loper. And Loper started at TaylorMade and went over to Callaway to head up their their ball division. And in doing so, he um, he was behind the TP series at TaylorMade. And, um, he kind of wanted to do a refresh on, uh, the Chrome soft and it's taken a number of years, but what you saw is that refresh and it's pretty impressive from, from my perspective as well. Yeah. I, and I know, I know you've done robotic testing gene with, with their golf balls, but yeah, we, we did a little bit of testing yesterday, um, and I, I don't want to get too much into it because I think we've got some well some content coming in the down the road with their products. But yeah, they 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 were doing some cool stuff with the golf ball right now. And I it's kind of interesting because we were we were talking about this yesterday, but but consumer buying habits and, and the way that golfers look at products, golf ball to me is one of those where there's been such a push in the last decade from manufacturers, from the true specs of the world to go get fit. But it, a lot of it still focuses on the clubs. And, and we were talking about, you know, golf ball, like you ask, a, it's not so much the fault of the fitters as, as much as it's more the fault of the, the golfers, because you ask them a golf ball they play and they kind of, some of them shrug their shoulders and it's like, well, I play like three or four different versions and you reach into their bag and they, they truly do. They have three or four different golf balls in there. They don't really know what they play. They might pick a golf ball up in the woods and play it great for nine holes. And I've done that plenty of times as you, many have heard on this podcast, but you know, it's, it's one of those areas where I feel like there's so much room for growth. And if you can optimize that ball to your bag, it would make such a difference. And, and I think that's what they're really pushing for is to just help educate golfers on not so much just the benefits of the Callaway golf balls, but, but the importance of, of dialing in that ball to your bag. And, you know, maybe I'm hoping, I'm hoping we see that down the road, but 
you know, some of that you got to get some buy-in from the golfers because a lot of them, I, I go back to Ben Griffin when we were talking about his switch to the max fly ball. I was shocked by how many people reached out to me on the side and said, oh man, I play that golf ball. I love that ball. And I, I was like, wow, there are a lot of people that play the max fly ball. And, and one of the, the main reasons why was they said it's a great golf ball and it's cheap. And I think that's why you see a lot of golfers go and buy, you know, the Costco. You know, Kirkland golf balls, pretty reasonable. And golfers don't want to pay an arm and a leg for golf ball technology. So you're going to have some fun ways to, to change that thinking. And the benefit is, you know, and whatever it is, I don't care what, I don't care what company the ball you're using, whether it be a Costco or Galilee or whatever, is like in the case of the Kirkland, people are buying two dozen at a time. And because it's inexpensive, they're using the same one every time. So they know how it reacts around the greens and they know whether it's like a top performing golf ball as far as distance and spin and it's optimized for them or not, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that they're using the same one every time. So they know their distances. They know how it's going to check around the greens. And that is a benefit down the line, which I think is something that you know we don't, well, we, we do overthink sometimes. We don't think about enough really when it comes to how that golf ball is going to perform when you hit like certain shots. Well, and, and I can tell you this from a historical standpoint, up until maybe six, seven years ago, um, I, I, I had companies that would take run, runs at the Pro V. So there's two types of golf balls, basically. There's Serling golf balls and urethane golf balls. Simple way to think about it. Serling golf balls, which is kind of a wide category, it can be anything from a two-piece distance to a three-piece almost performance coming close to a urethane on, on the lower level. Urethane golf balls are considered tour golf balls, and they have short game spin that's really exceptional in relation to Serling golf balls. Now, over the years, uh, I've seen companies take runs at Pro V1, and when I say companies – not the majors, but smaller companies. And they've come out and tested with me with urethane golf balls that have been effective, very close, if not equal to, and have totally failed in the marketplace. Uh, people just simply didn't believe the test results or they didn't buy into it. And then about six or seven years ago, maybe even a little bit longer, because I'm going back to like Snell and Vice, um, these companies started introducing these golf balls and kind of direct to consumer models and golfers started picking up on them. And then all of a sudden Max fly with the urethane golf balls. And then obviously Costco was a big one, but the, the veil has been pierced a little bit in that consumers golfers are willing to try out uh lesser brands not the majors for your thing golf balls and they're finding that the performance characteristics are very close at uh much cheaper prices so there has been a paradigm shift from consumer habits it used to be if it didn't have Titleist on it, it wasn't worth a damn. And now golfers are willing to experiment with all these different types of golf balls. And it is amazing. And what I would say is if you're value conscious, it's amazing what great deals there are out there with your thing golf balls. And just go buy a sleeve of Max Flies or go buy a sleeve and, and, and try them out. Now, the flip side of that is... If you want the best, and there is a slight difference, and this is what, you know, back to the to the uh, Chrome Tour discussion, the top companies, they're doing things with dispersion and consistency and manufacturing tolerances that are creating some of the best golf balls in the world. And, and golf ball in and out, you hit one in a lake and drop one, it's going to be very similar. It might not be the case on some of the lesser brands, and it's just simply a reality of cost, um, you know, versus quality. So, but if that doesn't matter to you, and you're a 16, 17, 18 handicapper, and your swing is the biggest, you know, determinant of what the golf shot's going to do, hey, go look at some of these urethane golf balls, and you're going to be shocked at what they do around the green and how they can, you know, help you control your spin with your short game. You know what else can help golfers around the green gene? Their putter and their putter grip. And, you know, for not much more or actually much less than a dozen golf balls, 
I'm editorializing here, or a little bit more than a sleeve of golf balls, you can focus on that most important part of the putt, and that is the moment of impact, because we're going to let you know about the Golf Pride's reverse taper putter grip. Find sponsors here at, uh, at Fully Equipped, and the biggest thing that is so cool about the reverse taper, other than the fact that, as the name implies, it is tapered in reverse, so the larger part of the grip is on the bottom hand, and the smaller part of the grip is in the top hand, is that it comes in three different sizes and two different shapes. Sorry, two different sizes and three different shapes. So if you're someone who prefers to putt with more of a traditional right-handed low, pistol grip works great for locking that top hand in while freeing up that lower hand. That's really what the reverse taper design is designed to do. And that is to reduce tension and help you square the putter easier at impact. And tests have proven when compared against a parallel style putter grip, that a reverse taper helps square the putter at impact more often to get that putt started online. So hopefully you can make a few more putts. And these shapes include not just the pistol, but there's also a flat, which is a more oval shaped, which works really well for players who prefer more to a, a palm to palm or a parallel style putting grip. And then there is the round, which works great for not just traditional style putter grips, which again is that right hand low, but players that prefer to have their forward hand lower. So again, right-handed golfers, that left hand low option to really help reduce tension in that hand and keep that right hand locked in place where you're, you just feel like it, it's kind of right where it's supposed to be as you're lining up your putt. So remember, you can go to golfpride.com to check out the full line of reverse taper grips and not just reverse taper grips, you know, number one player in the world. He's got himself a golf pride grip on there too. He just has one of the pro only. So again, if you might not be the best player, best player in the world, uh, but if you're you know, looking for something a little different, head, uh, head over to golfpride.com and check out the reverse taper grips as well. That was actually a very spirited conversation on golf ball. And we were able to hold off my, my off the rails bit that I wanted to throw in here. I, I, Yesterday, I met the most interesting guy in San Diego. He was my Uber you, driver. I was to say you were hanging out with Gene. No. <laughs> Gene, listen, Gene, in my in my opinion, was the most, but he's moved down to number two. Oh, was, was, the Ooh, most, was, was. I got it. I gotta seek. When this is this guy, guy coming on the pad? Yeah, I mean, he's gotta <laughs> oh, be on the pod now. Listen, the next time we're at, we're out here, I'm I'm ringing this guy up, and we're going out to dinner. Awesome. Awesome. So I, I got I to tell this story, okay, because it is pretty amazing. So um, yesterday I hailed an Uber from from Carlsbad back to the airport, and this do do any do any of y'all did you ever get a chance to meet Jim Achenbach? Oh yeah. Okay. Jim Achenbach was one of my favorite people in the industry. He worked for Golf Week for God. I mean, he was in the industry for for over for over fifty years. Um, just, just a, a gem of a guy, um, had one of the, one of the best laughs. Anytime you could get him to laugh, I mean, you knew it was, you knew it was Jim laughing. He, it was anyway, I say this because I hopped in the car and this guy starts talking and I had to do a double take. I'm like, this, this guy is the spinning image of Jim Achenbach. He, he talks like him. Um, and he, <laughs> he literally like pulled his car. If you've never been to, to Callaway headquarters before, they have the curbs are, are a little bit, uh, they have a little bit of, they, they don't look defined. Let's just put it that way. So you, it's very easy to like hit the curb, especially if you're an old man, which this guy did. And so he keeps talking to me about the curbs at Callaway. I hadn't been there in six years. He watches the LPGA tour. He doesn't watch the, the guys. Big fan of Lydia Co. I was hoping to, to write for the you know 40 odd minutes back to the airport. Instead, I was regaled with some of the most incredible stories. I have ever heard. So this guy grew up in Pacific Palisades. Uh, his father was a psych was um, a clinical professor of psychiatry at UCLA. He was Marlon Brando's psychiatrist, along with a whole bunch of other like A list celebrities. When when he was growing up in Pacific Palisades, and uh, his mother played bridge with Marilyn Hilton and he was initially pre-med at Oregon, uh, realized he didn't, he wasn't smart enough to go to medical school. So he talked his mom into, to helping him get a job interview for Hilton hotels. And Marilyn Hilton called a senior vice president from, from Hilton to fly out to California to interview him. 
uh, so that he could get a job as a dishwasher early on. Um, but he was the GM at the Waldorf Astoria. Trump uh, was Trump hired him to be the GM at a couple of his hotels early on. Um, this guy had some of the most amazing stories. He, you know, and again, I, a lot. I'm not expecting anybody out here to be fans of of Broadway, but uh, he talked about his dad called him up one time and asked him if he could get uh, if he could get him uh, if he could get Liza Minnelli. And uh, George Firth, who was a, a Tony Award winning uh, playwright, and he wrote, I don't know if you guys know Company, but it's, it, they, I think it turned it into a movie too. Anyway, this guy went out to dinner with, with, with George Firth, who was, who, was, uh, who was gay, and George Firth put his hand on, on, the guy's, on this guy's leg, and this is when he was the GM at the hotel, and he, he told me he called his dad up afterwards, and he's like, Dad. This guy made a pass at me, and uh, this guy, the, the guy's name who was driving the car was also George, and he says, oh, George, he goes, Every, everybody's gay out here. Thanks for the room, and like hung up on him because he'd gotten a room for Liza Minnelli. Uh, so somehow, some way, uh, George Firth actually wrote company while he was going to his sessions with this, with this gentleman's father, uh, and now the gentleman actually has the, the original manuscript for company. I mean, I've never met a guy like this. Wow. He just, just so fascinating. He had owned a nightclub in downtown San Diego as well as a restaurant. Uh, and he had lost them both. And he said, and so now in my, in my late years, I'm driving an Uber around to keep my home in La Jolla. Uh, but anyway, shout, shout out to George for, for the ride and for the stories, just the most fascinating gentleman I have ever met. And, and made for one hell of an Uber ride from Carlsbad back to the airport in San Diego. Sounds like the like old school, like Hollywood, like, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I think last time I was out there, um, we're talking about the difference between like New York and like LA and, and like California, just in general, like East coast versus West coast. And the East coast was like, if you go to Boston stuff is like hundreds and hundreds of, of years old, right? Like there's all like buildings. I mean, sidewalks are all crooked, but uh, no offense to Boston, at least where I was, you go to the old part, it's all over the place. Tree roots are pushing up everything. And you go to California, like, eh, since the forties, I mean, this was mostly like field. And even now, like a lot of places are still like pretty rugged and like newly developed versus you go to, again, like New York or the East coast. And it it's like, I feel like there's still like these people kicking around out there who are like, oh yeah, back in my day, Hollywood was like crazy. Like all these like would, they would have been like young teenagers whose parents would have yeah. been involved in the industry when the industry was a lot smaller and a lot more like that. If you, it, it almost feels like I feel like you met the gene of the of like the film industry, whereas yeah. Gene's like, man, you should have seen like Northwestern clubs back in the day. This guy used to pull up in his big Cadillac and he just <laughs> unload golf clubs and we test them and all kinds of stuff. Well, I I've got a. I got a great, since we're going off the rails, I got a great Broadway uh, golf story. So uh, my mom, towards the end of her life, uh, she used to send me obituaries from Palm Springs where I grew up. And she'd just send me random obituaries in the mail of people that we knew or whatever. And one day I got this obituary from Sidney Chaplin. And Sidney Chaplin owned a restaurant in Palm Springs called Chaplin's. And Sidney was the youngest uh, son or the youngest child of Charlie Chaplin. And he was a Broadway star. Um, uh, he was in the first production of Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. And I'm having these memories as I'm reading this uh, obituary. And, I'm, and so I call my mom up and I go, Mom, I go, Am I remembering this right? Did Sidney Chaplin sleep on our couch for a couple nights when I was a kid? And she goes, he slept on our couch for a month. He lived at our house for a month. <laughs> and I'm like, why did Sidney Chaplin sleep on our couch? And she's like, ask your father. So I call my dad. My dad was a club pro down in Palm Springs, and he was known as uh, a great teacher down in the desert. And so someone recommended Chaplin and Chaplin was uh, just this amazing character. Talk about a rock on tour. He would, uh, he would float back and forth between Europe 
and uh, the U.S., and he would just bounce around. And he loved golf, loved the Lakers, and loved cheap red wine, three things my father absolutely loved. So my dad gave him lessons, and he didn't have a place to stay. And so he came and, sa- and stayed with us and slept on our couch. And I remember going to school in the morning with Sidney Chaplin, passed out on the couch. And at night, he would regale us with these stories of Broadway. And back to RB's point, his mother, I mean, this wouldn't have flown. His mother was one of Charlie's teenage brides, you know, really, really kind of sketchy. But after they divorced, he said his mother had a mansion in Beverly Hills and she built a mansion across the street for parties. So they would go over and destroy that mansion for parties and then come back and live in this mansion. And yeah, oh those those are the stories that I can tell. There were a <laughs> lot of other ones that were just- Leave the rest for fully equipped uh, at dark. After dark. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to your point, it, it, it I, I mean, and granted, this was just the 70s, but it, even California was a lot smaller. And if you were in these certain areas like beach communities or resort communities, you ran across people like this and, and Oh, Gunther Sachs was the guy he stayed with in Europe who was married to Bridget Bardot. And Gunther was this professional photographer and he had uh, this bevy of quote unquote models that would run with him to all of his photo shoots and they were kicked out of the bevy once they hit 25. And yeah, it was just the, the totally first Leonardo t- DiCaprio. <laughs> Thank you, RB. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say that. <laughs> the uh, first Leo. Oh, uh, so I, I got two more George stories that I wanted to say for the very end that we're actually going to get to some, some real gear stuff. So, uh, George told me that he went to, he went to school in Malibu. And because he, he said uh, he said I, he almost got married three different times, once to a Playboy model, uh, once to a, uh, a news anchor in San Diego. And then there was there was one other, too, that was it was like a high profile. Maybe it was like an attorney or something like that. Anyway, and he said he never he never ended up getting married. He used the same ring all three times. <laughs> for proposals classy <laughs> pretty classy. awesome classy uh, yeah yeah, yeah. First ring. but he told me Recycling. he's like <laughs> so i said i said well i said what was your what was the failure to launch george and uh he told me that when he was going to school in malibu he's like listen he's like i i dated easily the the hottest girl at at, at, Mal- at malibu high and he said he got uh he got shipped off to uh went during vietnam he gets sh- she got shipped off and he got a dear john letter and uh, he came to find out that he, the girl that he was with in high school ended up uh, ended up getting with uh, Jim Morrison, who also went to Malibu High. So he lost he lost <laughs> he lost his girl to Jim Morrison to, to a real oh, rock star. Uh, anyway, thought that was crazy. The other one that was just the wildest story that he told was he came home uh, and he comes around the corner, and there were five Secret Service agents. And he's like, I don't know what's going on here. So he knocks on the door and his mom answers and he says, Hey, the secret service is here. And she's okay, come on in. And so he's following the secret service back because his dad had, had, um, fashioned one of the rooms in the house into, into his, uh, into his psychiatry, you know, psychology or psychiatry offices. And so they get to the back and the, the secret service is opening up the door. He has no idea who's inside and the phone rings and it's white house switchboard. And, uh, anyway, it was Ronald Reagan's daughter who was in there and, uh, who was, uh, Reagan's wife's first name. Remind me, Nancy, 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 Nancy Reagan is talking to George and she's like, Hey, can I talk to my daughter? And this was right when, uh, when, uh, the Reagan assassination attempt. And so she was calling, she called their house. She was, she was in the back doing uh, a session with uh with george's dad and i was like this guy has lived a life and has has seen some shit and uh anyway this again going back to like the most interesting man in the world like it's him gene i'm sorry you're you're number two he wins wins. wins. trust me no i get that one those (laughs) those stories are tough to be yeah yeah they, they were they were pretty incredible anyway all right so let's let's get to some real gear topics cobra you know so if we go back to the Masters, Bryson is in contention. 
and he's playing a set of 3D printed Avoda irons. And they, they generated a lot of press. But at the same time, as, as they were starting to generate press for, for the ways that they were helping Bryson with his game, Cobra was in the process of coming out with their own 3D printed product of their own that's going to be coming to retail. It's called the Limited. The, the E is actually a three, which I kind of like. The irons are, are going to be limited to 500 sets. They're $3,000 a piece. Yes, I'm sure people are already, I mean, I've already seen it. People are gawking at the price, but I, I think this is, I think this is the future for, for club design. And, and oh, by the way, we have uh, Mike Yagley from Cobra on this week on the podcast. I had a chance to, to chat with Yags recently about the new irons and in the future of iron design, club design, I should say, not just iron design. Uh, it was a really fun conversation, but when you see these irons, guys, what's what's your take? I mean, do we do we think three D printed irons are are the future? Are they too expensive to to mass produce? What what are your thoughts on on this new product from Cobra? I've so, got a little so, bit of a biased opinion on this one. I have go been, for it. I've been helping Yagley uh, and the team from Cobra for the last almost year and a half with input in their prototypes and design and applications for this particular 3d printed iron. Uh, so when I was out in Carlsbad last November, I saw some of the first prototypes and had an opportunity to hit some of the first working prototypes. And from where it was when it was just a, a 3d model to actually being able to hit it, provide more feedback, and uh, help with some of the design features and characteristics. Um, I am really excited for this product as we had some great conversations uh, about the, the potential applications for this and how to expand upon it. Uh, some of the different custom options and variants that you could offer going down this route of 3D printing irons or essentially 3D printing anything. As we know, Cobra's done 3D printed putters for a few generations now, and they have been really working on developing this iron. And I was uh, I was very humbled that they came to me and asked for my opinion and kind of brought me in and showed me some of the first renderings and where their heads were with designing this product. So I'm personally really excited to see this come to market and uh, really excited that uh, that they actually were able to bring this out to the marketplace. And I think it's something that's going to be being copied and used by a lot of other manufacturers going down the uh, going down the pipeline here because you can control so much more with 3D printing that you can with traditional forging or casting. So this is uh, this is something I think that is just the beginning and we're going to see a lot more of these designs rolling out in the future. That's just my Hot take, especially like I said, since I have a biased opinion that I was I was fortunate enough to provide some input and feedback. I will say for those uh, who are curious about them, you know, for uh, for one place you might be able to find one of these limited sets. I know they have some limited sets coming, and that is at fairwayjockey.com. They are a, another sponsor here at Fully Equipped, and they offer the world's most exclusive collection of aftermarket shafts and custom equipment built to tour level specifications. They offer the lowest prices on custom built clubs and it's up to 20% less than the average club fitting quote from other high end club fitting outfits out there. Um, they also offer, like I said, all of these different small batch limited releases, including these Cobra limited 3D printed irons. They've offered different Scotty Camerons, Bettinardi putters and anything else in between. So if you are curious, to check out, hopefully you can find these there. I'm not saying you're gonna get a set. I'm just saying they are at some point, will be available when they do come uh, for sale, uh, coming up very soon, as far as the Cobra irons are concerned. But if you are looking for anything from accessories to custom build clubs, head to fairwayjockey.com to check out their entire selection. So uh, I'd, I'd like to say first off, uh, Jay Wall, kudos to getting an interview with Yags. He's uh, He's one of the greatest guys in the industry. I mean, he is one of the nicest, smartest, and he's also a visionary. I mean, the things he's told me that he's worked on and seen from years past, he's he's just he's just a really, really unique um, 
and interesting individual that I think the spotlight should be shown on him because he's 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 really bright. Now, that being said, I have one question for you, and I haven't obviously listened to the interview, but what's the end game here? Uh, that's the only thing that I don't understand. Is this always going to be something that's a limited edition? or And RB, I, I haven't read your article. Apologies. So maybe that's you can okay. jump in, both of you. But I, I, I'm like... How does this go from 3D printing to, um, uh, as Chris was saying, kind of you know mass produce? I, I, I that's that's where I get a little lost in this. Can I say one thing that's very cool about this? And I know this is like very inside baseball, and and, it, and it's from Jonathan's point of view, is the one of 500 sets that, that they're making are only right-handed. But one of the so freaking coolest things about this is <laughs> why are you um, telling people this? <laughs> I know I should be telling. Yeah, it's it's fine. They're gonna see the pictures anyways. But um, first off, to the point about uh, Bryson, Bryson had been playing 3D printed irons from Cobra. It was just they never like wanted to like go out there and say that they were they were making them. They they'd done over 25 different projects for players that have been played on tour uh, that are 3D print, printed products. So this is why it's so important when we talk about this is that these are the consumer ready products. It's the first time consumer level product from an iron from irons has been available to consumers. But anyways, I think one of the coolest things about this is the ability to completely custom make clubs that are um, replaceable clubs, make things similar. Because as I said, these clubs only come available in right-handed. But as they told us when they were presenting us, because Jonathan was the first one to ask. And also because one of the guys at Cobra, uh, Ryan, I believe it was. Shout out Ryan Roach. Yeah. Yep. Who's one of their engineers. He's a lefty. So you know what he did? He's like, I want a damn lefty set. So I don't know if he built himself a full built himself a full set or it was just the one club for testing, but they've actually did like six uh, left-handed seven irons for players like Jonathan, who are in the testing environment to actually test this club in a left-handed version, which to me is like so cool because it costs 20,000. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of like, I'm thinking of like a forging die. It's like tens, a couple, like tens of thousands of dollars to like machine a forging die, which will wear out. And if you have the CAD file and one of these printers and the dust and the laser and the whole bit, like, boom, you could, you could literally print these out infinity without having the CAD file doesn't like corrupt because you use it more often. Right? Like that, that to me is like the craziest thing about this is that if you want to slowly make developmental changes, you don't have to change a die. You can just go in and say, we're going to tweak the file a little bit. And that to me is like so freaking cool when it comes to this whole thing, because now you can test for sound and acoustics and ball flight and all these different things as Chris, I didn't even see Chris. You got Chris is keep us in the dark in this stuff, but yeah, like he's on the inside. He's on the, he's a real insider here. Cause guy haven't seen any of this stuff like when it was prototype. Chris should be the one. Talking I, about. if, if, if Mike and Ryan are listening to the podcast, which I hope they do. Uh, I, I signed an NDA. I stayed true to my word. I didn't even tell my boys on the, the inside gear podcast that, uh, that I offered a little bit of input and, and, uh, feedback on this this little project that this I was the first we're hearing with. of it, Chris. This is the first we're hearing uh, of it. Let's put that in the record. There you go. Not break anything. I'm, I'm trustworthy. My NDA uh, word held up. Oh, but it was uh, it was super cool to see these things come together and actually come to market. And I mean, as far as the price point goes, that was a conversation that was had extremely early on as to what it charged for these things. Like, and the feedback that I gave them was that I mean, the market's already been tested and there is a demand and I mean, a sustainable model out there that's already been tried and true in the marketplace with PXG. Also, you look at Titleist with the concept irons. I mean, you have brands out there like Mira, you have Epon. So, I mean, there is a demand for unique, high-end quality products that are differentiated from the cast and forged offerings that are out there. So, I mean, I told them if Titleist is capable of producing an iron that commands a retail price at $500 a head in the concept, and it, PXG can do 350 ahead. Mira can do 350 ahead. I mean, Cobra is a reputable brand that's been gaining some traction in the quality of their products, especially recently. And there's no reason that they can't have a product that would have a demand at that three thousand dollar price point. Chris, what uh, in your testing? What's the closest uh, comparison that you would say? Like, you know, who does it? Who, who, 
where does this iron line up in in you know with with other irons in the marketplace? Ooh, tough to say. Um, I mean, it's a smaller profile than King Two or Gene, like okay. just just, yeah. just a little bit. And it's got 100 grams. And we didn't even talk about the tech. And I'm sure Chris is probably going to mention a little bit, but 100 grams of tungsten loaded in each one of these irons. And they're the, the claim is that, and I say claim because we we haven't had a chance to hit them yet. But but it's basically a a better player iron with game improvement forgiveness. So are the lofts uh, better players? So are they weaker yeah. lofts? Yeah. Okay. Weaker. Yeah. This is this okay. is not. There's there's no as golfers out there like to call there's no loft jacking going on here it's nope. it's simply so, yeah simply trying to retain ball speeds on those misses and, and yags even told a story when during our interview about hitting a shot and you know he thought for sure he was gonna just watch this ball peter out as it went off the toe and he said it basically ended up right on the green with where he normally hits his good shots so they're they're seeing some pretty incredible things well and that would bolster my argument you know that that players' blades, muscle backs, et cetera, are just complete wastes of time for the majority, even of elite golfers, because they do miss hit occasionally. And why be penalized for that? If you if you want the look, you know, of a player's iron and give you forgiveness. This will be really interesting to see how it's adopted amongst tour players and if they gravitate toward it. The other thing that I would think, because um, they're 3D printed. Your manufacturing tolerances have to be in tenths of a degree as opposed to degrees. So exactly. it, it, everything's got to be spot on. So you know that your six iron is going to go 10 yards longer than your seven iron because everything is, you know, has been tested. And that's really, really exciting um, because once you test that seven iron theoretically that set should be about as as solid as any set out there from a spec standpoint they touched on that in their presentation of how tight the tolerances are able to like they're able to achieve uh, which i thought was really fascinating and also um to your point about the loss yes like again out of the out of the printer basically um the or additive manufacturing process which I realize is they call it additive manufacturing because it's the opposite of CNC. CNC takes stuff away. This thing like builds it from nothing. Um, but the um, the material that they use is still pliable to be bent and adjusted. So I think we've seen this in the past where like- But it starts as a powder. Probably should point that out. Yeah, it starts as like a, a powder and then it gets laser. It literally gets like laser. Well, is there 2,700 layers or something? Like that? I think it was yeah. over almost 3,000 layers of this stuff. The way that it's done is is it's like- precision laser welded dust that creates the golf club. It's, it's so cool. It, it literally is one of the neatest things, like the way that it's done. Uh, but the material that they're using in this and there, and there's different, there's titanium, there's different steel alloys. There's all kinds of like different materials that are used to this process, depending on the application from the, from the, uh, the way that it's done in the machine, but it can still be bent and customized, which was not the case with some other uh, early versions of 3D printed golf clubs, where it was like, you kind of get what you get. And I think this goes to show, um, like Cobra does really want to push the envelope. I know other, other OEMs are pushing the envelope as well in other categories and all kinds of things. But like, if you look back, they've had, again, the first 3D printed putter that they launched uh, years ago to the consumer. They had CNC milled club faces on drivers, which is very cool. Um, we've seen that like offer consistency as far as products are concerned, like the original, like baffler golf club, like the wooden one was like the first kind of like real hybrid. I know, I know Gene's got a McCord story about that when he asked him to hit it and he just launched over a highway. We've heard that one, like they've done many different ways of innovating and they pushed the envelope and this is their, I think this is their like stake in the ground, their flag in the ground saying, look, we are going to offer this to consumers. We know people are doing this for R and D purposes, but this is what we want to do. And I think that's, that's probably one of the coolest things about this because it, it, it creates a benchmark for them themselves as well as other companies to be like, okay, like what can we do like this? Right. And I think that's, that's what's so cool about it. Well, Cobra is always punched above their weight as far as technology is concerned. They just, you know, unfortunately they just haven't had the marketing budgets to get a lot of their message out there, but they make amazing products 
and Yagley was behind the 3D printed putter and a lot of these innovations. And so, yeah. the, it, you know, they've been coming out with some amazing tech. They just, uh, yeah, unfortunately, they just haven't gotten the recognition in in the marketplace that that they should. Yeah, you know, it's Gene. You asked, like, what's what's the end game here? Uh, I, I don't even really know if Cobra is quite sure what it is. I think the the first thing they wanted to do was see if they could bring these irons to market, and that's what they're doing. They've done a lot of blind testing because my first question to them was, well, how does a three D printed iron feel and sound? compared to a, a forged product and they did they did it and Yagley said that as they were having better players in their pros uh Ricky Fowler Gary Woodland Justin Sa test these irons the guys would look over and they're like all right what is this seriously and it because the sound and the feel was so good and and that's when I think they realize oh geez like we're on to something here and it's it's a really cool design. Like I, I hope people can see up on up on golf.com the uh, RB story that he wrote on the irons. There is a there's a cutaway image of the internal cavity of this. And I like I said, there's there's hundred grams of tungsten packed into the the heel and the toe, but a, a majority of the rest of that head is compo- comprised of a lattice structure. And if you don't know what a lattice looks like, uh, Google it. But it's, 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 or, or look at, or look at previous like Cobra putters, you know, they've done the lattice design before. And what it does is it removes a lot of the weight and they're able to use that, that, you know, weight savings, discretionary weight. And I mean, in this case, it was like 35 grams, which when you think about an iron, if it's guys huge. are, if, if guys are, you know, and Yagley said this, if, if designers, and I'm stealing his thunder here from the interview that he did, but if if designers are able to to net like a, a savings of half a gram here, half a gram there, and you're like, oh man, we got we saved two grams that we can then put you know somewhere else to to benefit the performance of this iron. That's huge, but like over 30 grams is is mind blowing, and to also have this lattice design in the hitting area, and to still have it perform and feel and sound like a a fully forged product is a total game changer and so i i think that this is just the beginning for cobra i don't necessarily know because it because of how long the process takes and how expensive it is i don't we're not at a point where they can mass produce these that's why this is a very limited product for right now but down the road i mean who the heck knows i mean if you look at where computers were very early on and how much they cost and now you think about what a laptop costs and how small and lightweight they are. Uh, same thing with cell phones. I, I you know, I, I think the future is is very bright for three D printing in in the golf equipment space. And now that we've seen it in wedges and putters and and now irons, I I'm really excited for the future. And I, I think Cobra is Cobra's ahead of the curve here. And kind of to Chris's point, I think we're going to see other manufacturers try to emulate what they're doing in this space. Um, okay. Really quickly, there wasn't a whole lot going on this week at the PGA championship. As far as gear news, the only one that I did want to point out because we've seen these irons out on tour, but only in, in a single iron, the four iron, the, the tailor-made protos, those cavity back irons that we've seen Rory and, uh, Colin Morikawa using it's it, they're, they're, they're going to be coming out soon. We know it now. Because uh, Michael Block, Blocky, as he's known to everybody, the the PGA pro who made a name for himself uh, last year at the PGA Championship, he has a full set of these, and that means that his old um, tour preferreds are are have been kicked out of the bag. I wonder if he actually sold the the iron that because he had told me that he had when I was at Colonial last year, he told me that he he got an offer for like fifty k just to so somebody could buy that iron. I wonder if he sold it. I mean, he's made a whole bunch of money since then. I, I think he's, I think he's got enough sponsorship deals and whatnot to, to supplement his 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 lifestyle. But yeah, I wonder if he sold it. Uh, anyway, I think that's probably the biggest story from the week. N- not not a whole lot. I wasn't expecting much, but I think the rains probably kept guys from being able to to do little in the way of of like deep dive testing if they were going to do any for Valhalla. So, um, all right. Couple, couple 
housekeeping notes. Uh, last week, we announced that we're going to be giving away one of the new Cobra Dark Speed Volition America drivers. $650 driver. All we want is the best voicemail you can give us. We're going to do a voicemail pod here. And I was a little bit disappointed initially when the pod dropped last week on Thursday. Didn't get a whole lot. We, we now have a whole lot of voicemails. I think people have just been listening to the pod and now calling in. So if you want to leave a voicemail for the voicemail pod that we're going to be doing, and we're going to be choosing uh, the best voicemails, going to get the driver. The phone number is 602 602- 935-4974. Again, that's 602-935-4974. Leave us a voicemail. If you want to keep it gear related, cool. If you want to make it funny, uh, that that's not going to hurt your chances. Might actually help your chances. Uh, go ahead and do that, and we will uh, we'll answer. Man, there's going to be a bunch. There, either, we have we have over. I think we have over twenty five or thirty voicemails now. So it's going to be yeah. Well. Yeah, it's gonna be a big, and that's 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 as we're plugging it again. So it's gonna it's gonna be a biggie. Uh, anyway, leave us a voicemail. And with that, I think it's time to get into this week's interview. As I mentioned a couple of times already, already stole thunder a bit. I had a chance to talk with Mike Yagley from Cobra. Yags was one of the guys who helped bring the new Cobra Limited Irons to life. He's been a massive part of the development of many game changing products at Cobra during his time there. Had a lot of fun chatting with him. Enjoy the interview. All right. Well, we are in what I still like to commonly refer to as the golden age of golf equipment. We are seeing a, a rapid increase in new developments and new technologies in the space at a, at a breakneck pace. You know, it used to be years and years ago. It could even go decades and decades ago. It would take a while for something new to enter the space and really take hold. And now it's it's happening all the time. And I will say Cobra is is at the forefront of a lot of this change. Especially this guy that I'm looking at right now, Mike Yagley, <laughs> Cobra's VP of Innovation and AI. We were just talking before we started the this interview that just it feels like a title that that Yags probably came up with on his own, but it is not. <laughs> no, no. No, my boss, Dan Ladd, he's like, um, you got to throw some artificial intelligence in there. I said, yeah, my <laughs> wife would agree. Yeah, please throw something in there. Yeah. So, yeah, we're doing some AI. It's honestly, it's machine learning. But yeah. AI is a really cool catchphrase, right? But if, if you put a gun to everyone's head that's doing it, they'd say, yeah, it's really machine learning. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it, cool. It is, yeah. it is really cool. And I, I got to say, it, it's changed the way that, that a lot of manufacturers are designing products. Um, but I sat on a call last week, and as, as, as this podcast is coming out, week of the PGA Championship, uh, I guess it was a couple weeks ago. But I, I sat on this call, and you were very bullish. I, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever heard you this bullish about a, a product. You know, Cobra's, Cobra's done a lot in, in the AI space, uh, spe- particularly, they've done a lot of work in the, the 3D printing space. Yeah. Wedges, we've seen. Ricky Fowler has had them. Gary Woodland's had them in the bag. Now you're you're entering a new space. You're entering the the 3D printing space in irons. Why, why are you so excited about these new Cobra Limited irons? Um, for all sorts of reasons. One, um, you said it a couple minutes ago. Like things happen really fast. Um, you buy a television from Costco for. $10,000 about 15 years ago. And now that same TV, it's even better. It's worth is now it's like a thousand dollars. Well, um, what we are about to launch, if we would have done it like 10 years ago, it would have been literally like 10 to $15,000 per set. Um, so the technology, the cost, the like availability of 3d printing things has asymptotically, uh, decreased. And it's done it I, literally twice as fast as we thought it was going to. I'm sitting here having this conversation with you, and I thought it would have been another at least five, 10 years out. Um, so that's from a manufacturing standpoint, there's that. And then more importantly, there is the, hey, have you ever played a club that looks like a blade, feels like a blade, but has the forgiveness of a game improvement iron? And the answer is going to be no. The whole world's going to say no. So for us to be able to do that, 
with the 3D printing technology um, is why I'm so bullish on it. And yeah. I'll also tell you, I've had it in the bag for a couple of months and it's not coming out. It ain't coming out. <laughs> so let's start from the beginning with, with yeah. these irons. How how long have the new limited? By the way, limited people are people are just hearing the word and they're like L I M I T E D. No, you guys you guys <laughs> threw in the three, so yeah. it's L I M I T three D, which which makes a whole hell of a lot of sense when you see oh, it. Oh yeah. Uh, but how long have these things been in development for? Um, I would say about all in, probably four years, five years. When you consider. And I'm talking about you know this this construction this thing that we're we're using. We've been using metal 3D printing longer than that, but when we started working with a guy named Bryson and uh, Kyle and making iron sets for them or making um, utility irons for them that would hold up to their club head speeds, especially Kyle. I mean, the guy swings his his utility iron at 135 miles an hour. And when we made one that held together and he goes, this feels really good. It has great mass properties. Like, I like this thing. We're like, wow, we, we could do this. Like we could really do this. Um, but even then four or five years ago, we're like, okay, but it's going to be $8,000 or $9,000 a set. Well, Ryan Roach, my director of innovation has scoured the planet and he has found um, the right material, the right process, the right vendor, the right partners. Um, and we got a bunch of smart engineers sitting out there and we just figured out how to get this done so that you and I can play it. It's not cheap. Okay. It's not going to be cheap, but at the same time, it's not $10,000. Okay. Um, so all that just came together and I'm so proud of my team. And you just mentioned the limited with the three, uh, Jose Miraflor, you know, Jose really well. Oh, yeah. He jokes that there's these marketing guys that want to bust out of our engineers. Well, my team came up with the limited with the three little cheeky three. Yeah. Um, again, really proud of the team between Ryan and Drew Whited, uh, Jake, Mike McDonald. Um, they're awesome. Jake Stein North, by the way, didn't throw his last name in there. They just done a great job on this. They really have. So I'd I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Bryson because he was yeah. he was in the news recently at the Masters for for using a, a another brand's irons, um, touting them as, as 3D printed, and I think there are some people out there that maybe aren't in the know on the gear side that would say, oh wow, I mean this this is this is new this is something that 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 Bryson came up with and and they were able to design but but you guys were designing. 3D printed clubs for for Bryson when he was still at Cobra, correct? Oh yeah, when he was a pup. Oh yeah, yeah. He played a full set of what looked like King Tours, but since his specs are so funky, um, between the mass properties, well, just the weights of themselves, and then the lies and the lofts, you're like, you know what? Let's just print these things. Um, and like I said, utility irons, wedges, we did all sorts of funky stuff. I mean, I added them up, and there's at least 43. Now we probably have like 47. Cause I added up four days ago. So like, let's say there's upwards of 50 3d printed metal projects that we've done for tour. And some of them like never saw the light of day cause they were prototypes. They, they were not meant to see the light of day, but at this point I'd say 15 now over 15 have been in play between wedges, putters, irons, utility irons, everything. Um, we've been doing it for a while. All right, so I, I want to get into these irons because the design is is pretty mind blowing when you hear about it for the very first time. A a better player iron designed with with basically game improvement properties. What what is what is it about this iron? Why and why did you start with a better player? I mean, you could have maybe started with something a little bit more in the middle of the road. Why why start with an iron that's designed for somebody? that is maybe a single digit handicap? I would say there's a couple of reasons. So Bob Villian, our former president, who's now the president of Puma North America, he threw it down a long time ago. I mean, he threw it down when I first got here, like 13, 14 years ago. He's like, hey, can you make a better blade? I'm like, hmm, I don't know, it's forged, it's solid, it's tiny. I don't know, okay? So you get that throw down. And then if you look at like what players can actually sense and what players are really looking for, um, giving a blade player something that's way more forgiving and a lot more easier to get up in the air is remarkable. 
And then if you're looking at someone who's playing like a player's distance iron or a game improvement iron, and let's say they're progressing, like they're getting better, they're getting better fast. And like, I don't, I hate to say this, I don't need the loft jack. Okay. I don't, I don't need a seven iron that goes uh, 180 yards. I need a, my seven iron to stop when I want it to stop. And I'd love it if it felt really good. So if you look at, if you had a spectrum, it'd be like, there's a huge improvement at the blade end. And there's a huge improvement at this like player distance um, end of the spectrum. And then in the middle, you've got like a King tour. It's better than a King tour too. So as you look at that, it's like we had the greatest opportunity to make the diff biggest difference for players in that region, anywhere from a blade to I'd say like a player, or player distance iron, because they really do feel like a blade. Um, and they really do get up in the air because center gravity is remarkably low. And they're really forgiving because the moment of inertia is remarkably high compared to those types of irons. So that's why we did it that way. Um, Hose would probably say, damn it, I want a game improvement iron. We're like, yeah, but this makes the biggest difference. Like these players are going to notice it. And guess who, when he put it in the bag, said, these aren't coming out. That'd be Jose Miraflor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Of course he would, because he's he now would. he's he's now getting game improvement uh, forgiveness in in yeah. a in a better player profile. Uh, what what's the secret sauce here? I mean, you, I for people that are going to see these irons for the first time, they're they're going to notice there's there's a lattice structure kind of on the back yeah. side, uh, but they do again they look so much just like a like a better player iron. They're very they're very yeah. there's not a lot of bells and whistles on these, which, which I actually really love. Um, and again, I'm I'm bringing this back to myself here as a golfer, but. I, I love that they're they're simple. They're, there's there's a, like a minimalist look to them. There's there's not a lot going on. But what what is that secret sauce that allows you to make them game improvement, well, but in a smaller profile? Okay, we're going to start with what you said though. I'm going to pile on what you said. It's like that secret sauce of man, they look good. Okay, so imagine starting with a King Tour profile, which Ricky has played. I was just about Actually, to say, Rick I, plays those irons. Not, not has is. What am I saying? Is he's playing it? Okay, Justin Sub plays them. Um, these are tour players playing a King tour. All right. So that's blade like enough. They're like, yeah, but if we snunk that thing up, so imagine making the blade just a little bit shorter in its length, making the top line a little bit thinner, taking some of the offset away. So now it really looks like a blade. So people that like love the King tour, are like, well, I really love this thing. So there's your first moment of truth, right? You look at it, you're like, hmm, looks like a blade, smells like a blade. Let's see if it tastes like a blade. So now let's go inside. And we have 3d printed this as we've discussed. And, the 3D printing allows us to put an interior lattice that is made of the same, we'll call it parent metal. So it's a stainless steel powder that is fused together in a laser bed, okay? And the lattice goes from the back of the front, which means the back of the face, all the way through to the back of the iron. And it touches both surfaces. So it's attached internally to everything. That makes the iron stiff like a blade. I mean, if, if you looked at the modals, and we showed you those a couple of days ago, if you look at the modals, I mean, it has the same uh, vibration frequency and duration of that, of that sound as a blade, because it's really stiff. That's what makes a blade sound so good. It, it has a very high frequency, and it's a very short duration, so it's a like, crisp sound. So it sounds like that because of that internal lattice of touching everything. Well, now, you've essentially removed 100 grams from the internal core. I mean... It, I could hardly wait to show these things to people. We printed an internal core that is solid and one that is latticed and your brain just kind of freaks out because there's a hundred gram difference between these two chunks of steel. And you look at them and you think, oh, these are both going to be heavy steel. The one of them is remarkably lighter. So what do you do with the hundred grams? Well, you take some tungsten, you put it out in the toe, you put it in the heel, low and wide. And that's what gives you the lower CG, ball up in the air, high moment of inertia. I mean, they, I keep using the word remarkable. Um, they really are remarkable in their performance. We're talking like one or two shots. A player turns around and goes, what is this? Looks like a blade, smells like a blade, tastes like a blade, feels like a blade. But when I hit it on the toe, I didn't lose my 25 yards. And you know, what, what is this thing? They're confused. Um, yeah. which is, you mentioned, moment. you mentioned the blind yeah. testing when we were, yeah. when we were on that call. Um, and that was my, that was my first question was, you know, how, how good can a 3d printed iron feel compared to a forged iron? I mean, forged irons, golfers know they, they are designed to be consistent, but they also hang their hat on having just a buttery feel. 
And that's, that's what golfers love about that. And so when I hear 3d printed, I'm like, Oh man, I don't know. Can you, can you, you know, do that? But you, you guys went through blind testing. Like you said, there were golfers oh, yeah. that said, Oh man, what, what the heck is this? All of them, like literally all of them said, these feel great. They're hitting it versus a King tour or their own blades that they may have brought to the test. Every single one of them like, yeah, these feel great. What are they? We didn't say anything of the few people outside of the company that were in the know. They, they didn't get mad, but like, wow, I've never been fooled like this before. Right. If you would have told me this is hollow and I'm like, yeah, but it's not really hollow. That's the key here. It's not truly hollow with that lattice going from the, the face to the back of the iron. That makes it plenty stiff, plenty stiff. That's why it feels so good. Um, so I challenge people. It's like, okay, if you think it, a 3D printing can't do it, well, just go hit it. Just go hit it, and you're going to find that hmm, Cobra did it. This thing really does feel like a blade, look like a blade, and it's a hell of a lot more forgiving, gets up in the air. Before this iron, which which has uh, upwards of 100 grams of tungsten, what was what was the most amount of tungsten that you'd ever put inside an iron i'm gonna say like 65 70 somewhere in that range yeah I mean, that's a that's a significant increase oh, and yeah. that's just all it's just all from being able to have that that lattice structure on the in, inside of the head that allows you to yeah. just save that weight and it, you've been around golf and all these golfing nerds are listening right now you've heard me and others talk about oh we found a gram oh we relocated seven grams oh it was you know a gram i'm looking out of the, our room right now and these guys get excited about like literally a quarter of a gram i'm not exaggerating when they find because what happens is they find a quarter gram here and another half a gram there and two grams there and it adds up right so now you've got three or four grams that's significant okay we're talking about 30 more grams that we've ever put into an iron that forms it tungsten and 100 grams total were moving in mass that's massive pun intended yeah so when you're out there speaking to your game and, and the fact that you have these in the bag right now what are you seeing on those mishits how much how much more consistent are these irons even though they are you know slightly smaller than the king tours that that ricky yeah. and justin have in the bag what what are you seeing as, as far as that ball speed retention so I've seen it a couple of times. I can remember, and golfers are, we're weird this way. You remember like one shot from 50 years ago. Sorry, not that old, but like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, right? And your wife looks at you and goes, you can't remember our anniversary, but you can remember a shot from 10 years ago. So I had that experience a couple of times. I remember hitting a six iron at El Camino Country Club. It was an uphill par four. And I'm probably like a hundred and I don't know, 87 yards out. And I hit it. I hit it way out on the toe. I'm like, oh, that's just dead. It's like, you know, crap on the right and it's going to be short and I'm just dead. It was green high. And I went, oh, this really does work. Really does work. And you'll really notice it in the long irons, right? The short irons, people tend to hit those like, you know, pretty much in the middle. Um, there's not as much um, variation in hit location. But when you get to the long irons, you'll notice it. Um, so there was that shot. There was an eight iron at um, La Costa, number eight, par three. Again, left it out on the toe. And there's, if you've played there, you know that you don't want to be short and right because there's a creek that runs diagonally across there. And uh, I'm like, oh, it's dead. Nope, carried it. So there's just a couple of like, hmm, that's different. That's good. And then just the purity of the shots. So that those are the, those are the ones where I really noticed a big difference. But then there's just the, wow. Ball gets in the, up in the air a lot easier. Um, feels great. Uh, Jonathan, I haven't had a five iron in the bag that I play off the fairway in like five years. I just kind of gave up on it. Okay. Got a five iron in the bag. Got a four iron in the bag. I use a four iron primarily off the tee, but the five iron, I'm hitting out of the fairway. No problem. Out of the rough. I'm like a kid in a candy store. This is the kind of like fountain of youth I'm excited for people to experience. So there's going to be a lot of golfers out there that are listening <laughs> that are going to say that this sounds like a unicorn iron. What the, what the hell does it cost? Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know. What, what, is, what does it cost to, to create a unicorn iron? But let's, okay, let's go to unicorn, right? Because it, I love how you guys use it. 
Um, by the way, I love your show. And I've been dying to have this conversation with you for a couple of years now because you guys have said little things about, oh, nobody can do this and irons don't do that. And I'm like, oh, shit, just you wait. Just you wait. It's coming. <laughs> um, so this one really is a unicorn. It's not an abuse of that term at all. Um, $3,000. Okay. So not, yep. not outrageous. Yeah. Right. But not like your daddy's blade. Okay. Um, but it's worth it. Like I said, um, I really believe people are going to have that experience that I watched players having like blind testing. Um, I really believe that I've had great moments in my career, great moments where I've had products where you don't have to say a thing. You just have them hit it. Golf balls. I helped design. They're like, wow, how do you make a golf ball that is as long as a two piece distance ball, but it spins like a blotter ball. I don't know. Go ahead. Just hit it. Right. This is one of those kind of moments. It's, it literally is one of those kind of moments. Um, so I'm just excited for people to experience it. Where does this rank on your favorite projects you've ever worked on since you've been in the industry? You know, um, you've worked on some fun ones, by the way. I really have. I really have. Yes. I was at Maxfly, worked on tour Bellatus and golf balls like that. Callaway working on the rule 35, you know, it's a pro V one before there was a pro V one. Um, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Okay. I'm just based on my excitement level, like my excitement to come into work, my excitement to talk about it, my excitement to work with the team on this and what could be coming. Okay. It's number one right now. And I've had a really great career in golf and aerospace. This is number one right now. Yeah. So I always look at, at, you know, some of these innovations within the industry and you always wonder like, is, is this the future? And, and again, Cobra has been at the forefront of a lot of these changes, but it does make me wonder, like, where do you see 3d printing going ah, in, that's in, a great in, question. Your, in your industry? Is this, is yeah. this the future? Is this just something that we're going to see a select number of, of manufacturers embrace? What, what are your thoughts here? That's, I've not been asked that question yet. That's a great question. And you put two words together and I'm going to modify it slightly. You said the future, and I'm going to add a few words and say, it's going to be part of the future. Okay. I don't see forging going away. I don't see casting going away. I mean, those really serve a purpose. They really do. I mean, you can make great golf clubs from those, those types of processes and those materials, but there's things you cannot do with forging or casting or machining or any other way other than 3d printing. Does 3d printing replace everything? Um, i not in the foreseeable future because the, the material itself is more expensive. I mean, this stuff, it feels like powdered sugar in your hands. I mean, this is, it's not trivial to take a chunk of steel and turn it into powdered sugar. Okay. So just inherently the material cost is higher. And I don't think it's ever going to get, get down to the, an ingot cost. The process is more expensive. You're melting this powder with a laser. Okay. It's not like you're putting it in a furnace. You've got a 700 pounds of steel and you're pouring it into some casting molds. I mean, it's just the scale of it is just different. Um, so it has its place. It's not going to take the place of everything. That'd be my two cents on that. So you, you look at the sticker price, $3,000 for, for a set. And you, I've heard you mention just some of the steps involved. I mean, how many more steps are involved with 3d printing a set of irons versus a set of, of like forged blades with a, with a similar profile? Hmm. Now it might sound like you're underselling it, right? Because with the forge blade, you're going to hit it with a 200 ton press five times. And you go from an ingot to a shape, right? And if you've ever seen one of these things, it's frightening. We're talking three stories high and a massive load that goes bam when it hits it, right? So that's a big process. Uh, casting, melting a whole bunch of steel and pouring it into a mold. But to make the mold, you had to go through like three or four steps, maybe more. Okay. So with 3D printing, you've got a machine the size of my office, and you've got a bed of powder and anywhere from two to multiple lasers that are fusing the metal and then laying down another layer and then fusing that metal, then laying down another layer. Um, takes about 24 hours to print a set of these irons right now. You got a block of them. Let's say there's 30 on a plate. Um, 
So from a steps wise, it looks simpler to 3D print it because it's much less space and it's cleaner, it's nicer, it's not really loud, it's not dirty, it's not hot. Um, but there's a lot going on inside that machine. A 3D printing person might say, oh no, there's 2,600 layers. So there's literally 2,600 steps just to make that piece. Okay, that's fair. Um, so I would say the intricate complications of 3D printing is far beyond what you see with casting and and forging. But if you were to watch the process, just stand outside the box that's printing these, you're like, what the hell's going on in there? So it's really, it's a it's a great question and you'd have to dive into it. You'd have to get some philosophers in there and some uh, some mechanical engineers, a couple metallurgists and go, okay, which one's really more complicated? Which one's more steps? But then you've got a part. Once you've got a forge part or a cast part or a 3D printed part, they're all metal, they're all pretty solid. And now the steps are very similar, right? If you're gonna put some weights in it and weld them on or however you're gonna do it, you're doing that to all of them. You're gonna grind off any of the excess tooling marks that are on them. You're gonna polish them, you're gonna chrome them. You're going to put some grooves on them. So the processes after they're formed are very similar, but very different in the forming process. The the initial run, I should point out, this is this is not just a, a retail release. You're you're only dropping 500 sets of these, yeah, with the initial limited. But but it does make me wonder, Yags, like what is what's the the future of of 3d printing is this is this something that we could see come out are you are you considering is cobra considering trying to to mass produce these could you mass produce them is that is that even something that that you would ever want to do because it just feels like again talking about all the steps and the money involved in trying to create these sets i i do i wonder if if this is something that could even be mass produced in the future yes 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 and yes because i think you said Consider yes. Could you? Yes. Would you? Yes. Will we? TBD. Okay. You didn't ask the will we, will we, because I love, I love that you didn't ask that one because that's a tough one. I was one. waiting. What's I was that? waiting yeah. for you. Yeah. 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 yeah I'll answer it for you right now. Okay. Uh, TBD. We'll see how this goes. Um, yeah. All those things are possible. It's, it's about scaling it now at this point. So if you've got, let's say five machines or four machines that are making what we're about to sell, right? Well, that that vendor or factory, whatever you want to call us, says, okay, we've got we've got five. Let's get five more. It's the same with casting and forging. It's like, oh, we've got one two hundred ton press. Well, let's double our capacity. So they buy another one. We've got one big smelter and a and a bunch of places to make the shells for casting. Well, let's double our capacity. It's just a capacity thing. It can be done. Um, my bosses when I love it when I say this. It's not trivial. I mean it these machines aren't cheap. Um, like I said, the material's expensive. You know, the supply chain of the material is like, it's it's new. This is a new deal. Um, but yeah, could we? Yes. Should we? Hell yes. I'll answer it that way. <laughs> so my boss, if he had listens to this, like, hell yes, we should do that. Um, I'm, I just, I'm just excited for what we're about to do and what we can do in the future. Well, I'm, I'll pile on a little bit more before you even ask the next question. Um, you saw Ricky Fowler's wedge. Right. Yep. Ben grinds, grinds the perfect grind for Ricky. And then Ben has to grind it again. And Ricky goes, that's not quite the same thing. So Ben's like, damn it. How am I going to duplicate this? Brings it in. Mike McDonald scans it. One of the guys cads it up. I think it was Drew catted it up and we print it. Ricky takes one shot. He goes, yep, that's it. Gary Woodland takes one shot. Goes, I want those. Right. So we make some for Gary Duffner. We got his wedge scanned it. Duffner takes one shot. He goes, yep, that'll do it. That's pretty remarkable. That's a really cool thing you can do with 3D printing that uh, it's just hard to do other ways. We're not going to tool that up. We're going to make 10 wedges for Ricky. We're going to make a tool that costs $10,000 for 10 wedges. No. So 3D printing just steps in and says, hey, I'll do that. We've seen custom fitting take hold of, of the equipment space. Mm -hmm. and, and I know everybody was waiting for this. For, for years, it felt like there was some resistance to getting fit for your clubs. It's a whole lot easier to just buy off the rack. You see a driver, you pick it up, you hit a couple shots in the, in the hitting bay and you walk out and it's like, man, why would you do that? It's a, it's a $500 driver. And, and now we're really starting to see 
consumers change their way of thinking. They they start with making sure that these these clubs are custom fit, which brings me to three D printing because I I do wonder about this when I when I hear you talk about you know making uh, a wedge for Ricky Fowler and then being able to replicate it. it do you think three D printing could become part of the custom fitting experience. Do you think at any point down the road, we could get to a, a point where golfers go in and then next thing they know, they could get a set of custom printed irons that are exactly designed to everything that they want. I mean, if they're willing to pay for it, but do you, th- do you think that we could ever get to that place? You know, I'm sorry. We've got a really bad connection. <laughs> like for the last minute and a half, I couldn't hear a damn thing you said. I, I really don't know what you asked me. Okay. Um, and I'm running out of time. Okay. I mean, I got to get to my next meeting. <laughs> don't I, do I, this, Yags. I, don't, uh, don't you do answer it. The, answer the don't damn question. Do it. Don't answer you the damn do it. Question. Oh, no. No. My, my lawyer is sitting right over here. Right. I put my hand over the microphone. I'm sorry. Next question, please. Next question. I don't I think, know. I think, the, I think the, no com- the no comment probably speaks, uh, speaks volumes yeah. to, to where Can we just leave it at that? Can we just leave maybe, it there? Are you saying maybe I'm onto something? <laughs> I don't know. Oh man, you're killing me. You're killing me. I should have given you a list of questions you can ask and a list of questions you can't ask. Okay, uh, Jack Wagon. I fly. I fly too close to the sun in this industry. <laughs> you and- just <laughs> melted. Yes, you did. Whew. Uh, I'm actually sweating. Okay, I'm sweating. <laughs> I don't know. That's a great idea. We've ne- you know what? We've never thought of that. Uh, I'm sure you have. How was it. that? There, there, there we, there we go. There we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so if you can, if you can come up with a set of of better player irons with the improvement properties, is is this is this? I'm assuming is probably going to be the start of something larger. I mean, this this probably isn't going to going to begin and end with a set of limited irons for Cobra. This this feels like the start of something much bigger. Fair yes. to say. Yeah, that's fair. That is fair. Um, that we're looking at all sorts of options. Um, we could go to either either end of the spectrum or even towards ends of the spectrum. Right? You could go even bladier. And you heard how much weight we're able to get out, right? So if you make it even more compact, you won't be able to save as much weight, but you'll be able to save a lot, okay? A lot of weight. And then if you want a bigger profile, you could save even more weight. So as much as we're kind of in, in the middle of that player category now, we could move more towards the edges of it and give them even more significant performance. Um, those are options. Jose's like screaming for a game improvement, like flat out game improvement. So we're looking at all sorts of different things. Where where do Ricky and Justin and Gary stand on on these limited irons? Do we is is there a point where we could see them start testing them out out on out on tour? Are they they pretty well set with what they got right now? I mean, I got to think that this type of forgiveness in an iron is is something that they have to be very excited about. I know it's in the middle of the season right now, and again, that's yeah. that's also something that's interesting. You guys are releasing these during the PGA Championship week, which I I found quite fascinating. But but yeah, where where do the tour pros stand on on these, and, and will we see them in the bag at some point this season? Um. This season, I would say big question mark, right? And you hit the nail on the head. They're already mid-season, right? Um, if we would have come to these guys with the irons back in like October of last year, um, I think we could have got a couple of sets in play because you always have to tweak stuff, right? It's like, oh, I'd, you know, Ben might have to Ben loft and lie. We're going to like, mm, we'd rather print those, okay? Because then we can keep the sole grind just exactly like it's supposed to be because as soon as you start changing things, right? everything's coupled loft and lie and, and soul location. I'm going to say not the shape because shape doesn't change when you bend it, but it's, it's relative location changes. You've changed the bounce angle, right? Um, getting the CG in the right place, all those types of things. Um, we're going to keep working with them and you, you nailed it. It's like, man, it's mid season. I mean, do you really like get a different set of clubs in somebody's bag? It's tough. It's really tough. Um, hell let's back up a, now it's a year and three months. It's when this. It's not when it started, but it kind of started. We're already doing it. We're doing all this stuff. And Dan Ladd, our boss, says, I want to commercialize this this year. And we're like, what? Are you kidding me? I mean, it takes two years to go from, here's the idea. And we give it to 
eat hose and Tom Wolsowski and say, okay, here's an, here's an innovation thing, turn it into a product. That takes two years from that point. He wanted it done in that year. We're like, what are you talking about? Okay. So we're like, all right, we accept. And literally the code name for this project is Apollo. Because when he threw that down, all of us, I mean, I work with Dan Ladd. I know Dan Ladd. He's no Jack Kennedy. You remember that <laughs> quote from a long, long time ago? Oh, yeah. But when Kennedy threw it down, it's like, we're going to the moon. Okay. And not because it's easy, because it's hard. I'm like, holy crap, this isn't going to be easy. And so we codenamed that thing Apollo right away because it's just the right thing to do. We didn't get it done in a, in a year. And Dan's like, once we're like into like November, like boss, this, I mean, a year, this year was just way too tight. He goes, that's fine. He goes, I just really want to challenge you. I want to see what you could do. So for us to get it done in the equivalent of about 15 months is truly remarkable. Whole new process, product that's never existed. Um, my guys working their asses off to make this thing happen. Um, in the middle of all that, we didn't have something to like have Ricky test last October. It just wasn't there. So that's why. We'll get there. I mean, they've hit them. They're like, wow, these feel great. These are really forgiving, right? It's not my exact ball flight, which we understood. We knew that. It was like, yeah, they're just different from yours. Imagine giving Ricky exactly what he wants. The loft, the lie, the look, the center gravity location so he gets his perfect ball flight and a significant amount of moment of inertia increase. I, I don't think he's going to argue with that. I mean, tour players don't work their ball by missing it. They work their ball by changing their face to path and attack angle, but trying to hit it right in the middle. Okay. Give him a moment of inertia. How could you say no to that? How could anybody say no to that from an iron standpoint? So, like, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I went off there. <laughs> no, you didn't, but I, I, I feel don't even like know I, what you asked. <laughs> what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you about tour pros and, and whether yeah. they were going to be yeah. using these this year, but, but you gave me, yeah. you gave me a good answer. I feel like that's a good, that's a good place to like, to call it on this, on this interview. Yeah. Cause this was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I appreciated the banter and, and the honesty. And congrats again on the release of Cobra's new limited iron. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Keep up with the good work. Your show's great. I love it, man. Thank you. And that'll do it for episode 241 of Fully Equipped. Thanks again to Yags for the interview. As always, if you want more gear goodness, check us out on our social channels. We are at fully underscore equipped on Twitter and at fully equipped golf on Instagram and the YouTube page. And if you have not subscribed, Please like and subscribe. We'd appreciate it. Enjoy the PGA Championship, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.